I am here with Janine Jadario, who is the Chief Marketing Officer for Guitar Center. So thanks for joining us, Janine. Thanks, Joe. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Well, uh, I want you to, if you could, tell us a little bit more about Guitar Center, because I know it's not just the retail stores, although probably most people think of the retail stores. And then once you've told us a little bit more about Guitar Center, if you could share your journey to your current role. I know you've worked at some pretty interesting places along the way, so I'll let yeah. you take it from here. Happy to. So um, Guitar Center is uh, the largest retailer of musical instruments uh, as a company in the world, truthfully. Um, we are made up of four brands, actually five brands. Uh, Guitar Center brand is retail. It's omni-channel retail, so it's retail stores, almost 300 retail stores. It is a very robust dot-com business, call center. We have a professional division that services business to business. Um, and so it is you know, fully omni-channel retail and it is the largest brand in the portfolio. But we also have sister brands. So Music and Arts is our uh, other retail brand. It has about 265 stores. It is not national footprint quite yet. So predominantly East, Southeast, a little bit in the Southwest, um, but expanding. Music and arts is really more um, the place where your child might rent their musical instrument for school. So clarinets, woodwinds, brass, um, they do lessons, rentals, repairs, and then they're obviously retail and, and gear selling. Um, but, uh, and also services schools. So they have a business to business relationship with schools. We also have Woodwind Brasswind, which is similar to and part of um, music and arts. And Woodwind Brasswind serves more of the professional kind of level uh, band, orchestra, symphony, um, marching band, um, and professional players. And then we've got um, Musician's Friend, which is pureplay.com. So it has a call center um, and then, of course, the, the website and web sales. And then finally, we have AVDG, and AVDG is a recent acquisition in the last few years, and they are really focused on the business customer, some high-end residential, but they do a lot of installation for audio video. Huh. So, um, you know, studios and recording, and they do um, conference centers for, um, you know, major employers and that kind of thing. Um, and they're uh, another part of our business overall. So we're multifaceted wow. um, across a variety of things. Well, so when I hear Guitar Center, I think guitars, but it sounds like it's not just guitars at all. That, that's true. It's not just guitars. And we, um, Guitar Center, well, the Guitar Center brand is predominantly, you know, guitars. And I don't want to say overly so, but a good mix of our business. We like to think about our business at Guitar Center as sort of in what they call combo. So if you think about what makes a band, it's, you know, guitars, it's drums, it's keyboards, um, and then it is all of the other parts of, you know, that performance that we sell. So everything from live sound to recording to lighting. So it's everything you need for that wow. musical journey. Cool. Yeah. So a full service band in a box. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I love it. I love exactly. it. it. Maybe I gave you a new, a new. Uh, I'm writing that one experience. down, Joe. Band in a box. <laughs> all yours. Full service band in the box. I love Thank it. Thank you. So, so tell us about, you've had a really interesting journey and worked for some really interesting companies. So could you just tell us a little bit about your path and, and to the role that you're in now? Sure. Um, you know, I've had a, a really, you know, fortunate career. I'm, I'm proud of it. I've loved every place that I've worked. Um, I started out my, my you know, world in, in the beverage business. I worked for the Coors Brewing Company for about 10 years. Um, transitioned in a, in, in a variety of roles from field marketing to brand marketing and, um, you know, national promotions, sports marketing. So I did a lot of different roles in that company. Moved to Pepsi, where I worked on carbonated soft drinks. So, um, you know, the Pepsi family of brands, Mountain Dew, uh, launched Sierra Mist, launched Flavors. So had a lot of experience um, launching new products, you know, some great, some not so great. Um, <laughs> it, it, for those that remember Pepsi Blue, um, which is coming back, it, by the way, it, which is it, awesome. It, it got some PR attention, though. <laughs> yeah, it sure did. Um, and then uh, I moved from Pepsi. I was recruited to the Walt Disney Company, which is but a brand I'd always admired. And I went to work for um, Disney here in Los Angeles. And I spent 10 years at the Walt Disney Company 
um, working across uh, consumer products, franchises, which are you know our version of brands. Um, and then I did a synergy role where I worked across multiple divisions and ultimately was the um, VP of marketing for infant, toddler, and preschool brands, which included you know, Winnie the Pooh and Mickey Mouse. And I, I, I have the distinction of being able to tell people that I was Mickey Mouse's boss. Which, yeah, right. um, he's a great employee, by the way. Yeah. Um, and then I, I was recruited to a role at Stanford, which was um, a really interesting opportunity. I'd been at Disney for 10 years and my thinking was huge company, probably the likelihood of me moving up to a CMO role in a company of 200,000, probably a little less um, lesser odds. And I was recruited to Stanford to the, um, the School of Medicine and the Stanford Medicine Division, which is the Children's Hospital, Adults Hospital, and then all the physician networks as their CMO. Um, so it was my first CMO gig and they um, really wanted somebody who could bring a strong brand perspective and a strong marketing perspective. They didn't want somebody in healthcare, mm -hmm. which I thought was really progressive at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they really wanted some help in dispelling this academic medical, medical institution sort of feel and be really more customer centric and, be, and to be talking to customers about you know who they are and what they what they offer, which was an amazing opportunity for me. Um, most particularly around the the children's hospital was, um, I think for me, kind of life changing to see you know how parents are you know deal with you know very sick children. Yeah. Um, so from there, I was recruited to go to Whole Foods as the CMO, and I took on that role, which was uber interesting, really fun brand, very small portion of the. Um, of the grocery business, about 1% share, but um, the largest share of the natural and organic business. So just a really great opportunity to learn to, you know, a, a very mission-based brand. Um, it was interesting, the connections between healthcare and, and then, you know, kind of healthy eating. So really kind of a nice transition for me. Um, about that time, after a couple of years, uh, Amazon, you know, came in and acquired Whole Foods. My husband got a job in Los Angeles that he really wanted to take. And I thought, probably want to stay with my husband if he's going to be in Los Angeles versus staying in Austin, Texas. So we came out um, here and I did some consulting work in, in entertainment. A lot of the people that I knew at Disney had moved to different um, entertainment entities. I got to work for, do some work for DreamWorks, some work for NBC Universal, some work for Fox. And then a friend of mine asked me um, if I would step in. She'd had an, uh, a crisis in her company with their CMO um, uh, who had departed. Um, and so I stepped in at Applebee's to help her through that transition. And then ultimately um, was recruited to come to Guitar Center. So this is literally my, just about uh, end of my 10th year as a CMO um, yeah. in a variety of different locations and experiences. And you've been at Guitar Center around four years now, right? Just about four years, correct. Okay, great. Um, so I'm curious, you, you've had some interesting stops along the way, and you've even moved around a couple of times, you know, mm -hmm. physical cities to, to, for the different jobs. Yeah. Is there a piece of advice that you wish that you'd gotten earlier in your career, or maybe even a piece of advice that you would give to somebody younger starting out that you wish, you know, that, that, that they'll appreciate in the future? Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I made a lot of decisions to move along the way because I felt that I, I needed to do so. And, um, and at the time, probably did. But being flexible and thinking through what do you really want in the opportunity, it's a very hard, it's hard to move your family. It's hard to move, you know, your, your kids, your, your spouse, all of that. Um, but the, the best advice that I would give anybody is give it a try, you know, consider it an adventure. You mm -hmm. know, we would say every, you know, kind of move that we made with my daughter and my husband and I would say, it's our, it's our big adventure. And we'd go off and try to explore the new place that we were moving to, um, to get to know the area, to, you know, to take advantage of what it was and, and, and get to know kind of people and um, kind of look at it that way. I think it has built a sense of adventure in our family and a, and, and a sense of, you know, exploration with my daughter, for sure. She's now in college and thinking about opportunities that would take her potentially anywhere in the world. Right. 
Well, and I think she got a flavor for that by moving around a couple of times that maybe I don't have to be stuck in Los Angeles if that's not where I want to be necessarily. Yeah. And, and the, the interesting thing, I think, for her and, and for us, too, is, you know, electronic you know, communication has changed so much of the you don't have to be where you need to be, you know, face to face all the time. And so she's done a great job of keeping up with friends that she met along the way mm. just through, you know, Zoom and text and email and so on. So and social. That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, I think marketers are naturally a fairly optimistic bunch. And I think that you're probably pretty optimistic. And I love that perspective of when you move to a new place, it's a new adventure versus the downside, which is, oh, my friends are at the old place and I knew where things were and I felt comfortable at the old place. It's that sense of optimism and excitement yeah. about the new adventure. So I don't know. Um, I think everybody has a superpower of some kind. I'm wondering if that optimism and sense of adventure might be yours or if it's something else. You know, I think that's a really good, I hadn't thought of it as a superpower, but probably is. Um, I think that, you know, you asked me earlier to think about my superpower. And one is I know it's fueled by caffeine. So whatever <laughs> it is, it, there's caffeine involved in it. Um, I think my superpower is humor. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the way you break the ice, it's the way that you kind of make, you know, difficult situations a bit, a little bit less so, and, and having fun is part of it. So it's sort of that tie in of your best, you know, kind of willingness to be adventurous and optimistic and have a sense of humor and just a little sense of fun. Yeah. I think that's great because we're, you know, work is called work for a reason. We, we, my wife and I have talked about this a lot, that it's work for a reason and not just called fun or play, mm -hmm. but there's no reason that we can't enjoy our time while we work too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think it also connects you to, to your team and to the others you work with when you have that sort of sense of fun and, and humor and willingness to kind of break the ice a little bit. Um, you know, I, I will be honest with you, it was a little harder when I was working in, in you know, medicine and healthcare. Right, uh, right, right. With serious issues. Serious, serious issue. Yeah. yeah. Although since then, I have, I have to admit, I've said occasionally in, at Guitar Center, it's not brain surgery because it really right. isn't. So, um, right. you know, you, know what brain, you remember what brain surgery I, you is. You know like, what that's like. like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So, um, that, as we're speaking now, we're in the tail end of a pandemic. Everybody's been getting vaccinated and yeah. starting to go eat at restaurants and be out in the world again a little bit. And so I know retail particularly had a very difficult time through part of the pandemic. Sure. Um, I know Guitar Center, like many retailers, you know, there weren't as many people come into the stores on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. I'm, but aside from that, I'm just curious, as a marketer, what's the biggest challenge that you face? It can either be related to the pandemic or even not related to the pandemic. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, there's two things that um, will always stick with me in the pandemic. One is, um, you know, we had to close stores for a period of time. We had to pivot very quickly um, to support, you know, more dramatically support our online business, which is where consumers were moving. And then we, you know, in all of our stores, we do lessons. And so we had all these lesson students that, you know, right. didn't take their lessons. And so we pivoted very quickly um, to online lessons and we pivoted to buy online, pick up, you know, curbside. And um, the- Also ability, known as BOPUS. BOPUS, and this was <laughs> Bo, Bo pick up curbside, BOPUC. So, um, you know, I think that the, the thing that I will always take away is the need to be nimble and when to be nimble and how to be nimble. Sometimes it's forced on you. Yeah. Sometimes it's, you know, it's just kind of the situation that it is. And then sometimes you have to stop being nimble and get back to sort of really strong strategic planning and you have to know when. And, and I think up until the pandemic, we would never have thought about that, right? We've You're never right. thought about well, when do we need to be nimble because we were, you know, executing against our plan. Um, well, the best laid plans, you know, in a pandemic don't always materialize. Right. So for me, it's that. And then the other thing I think, it, you know, that was very challenging to go through was, you know, with store closures and, you know, with everything that we um, were dealing with in 2020, you know, we had to furlough people and we had to lay off people. And that is gut-wrenching. And 
Um, and these are good people. Not This isn't about performance issues. This is all about, you know, keeping the company, you know, moving and keeping the company, you know, capable to survive. And that was just heartbreaking for me to have to go through. Um, yeah. You know, we've since brought back, you know, all of our furloughed employees, which is great. And we're beginning to fill, you know, some of the roles that we um, had open. And that feels really good to be coming back together. Yeah. Um, the, well, the, I think at this point in, in, in a time of recording, I think the whole everybody in the country is feeling more optimistic about the where where things are going and go out and rent an instrument, buy an instrument, take a lesson. You know, now is the time to go into yeah. Guitar Center and, and, you know, feel safe to be able to do some of these things that maybe you didn't feel safe at the beginning of, of the pandemic. So yeah. pretty exciting to, to get there. Yeah, very exciting. And, and people turned to playing. They turned to music. And, you know, we saw growth across a variety of instruments. Look at you with your trumpet there. I, uh, this was my grandmother's trumpet. Uh, it was Aww. built in 1928. And I started taking lessons uh, in 2021. Uh, for, you know, so I yeah. think, I think you're right. Like uh, music was one way for people to deal with this mm -hmm. pandemic. Yeah. And I also think that people coming out of the pandemic have a different perspective on life and in work and their personal time and their enjoyment and the things that they use for solace and music has certainly stayed part of that. And we continue to see, you know, people buying musical instruments and taking lessons and being engaged um, at all, all time high record levels, which is, is pretty incredible. Cool. I love it. I, I'm so appreciative. As a, as a guy who's always had music in my soul and cared about music a lot, I'm, I want to see you thrive. I want to see <laughs> you grow. Uh, I'm excited about, you know, Guitar Center and what you're doing. So um, talk about how either you find inspiration or how do you find inspiration for your team? So and that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that I know that you're going to ask later on about, you know, skills and things that are important, but I, I want to tell you that the thing for me that I always hire for is a level of intellectual curiosity, willing to go to find the comparatives, looking to see what's out there, looking at what the competitors are doing, looking what non-competitors in other spaces are doing, you know, asking questions and being curious. And for me, it's been that same thing that has kept us going is, you know, keeping finding inspiration in what others are doing and the success that others are having. You know, I, I recently um, shared a piece that I was just so inspired by that Gap Old Navy had done with their development. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, this way onward is their program, but their development of, you know, um, community youth into you know, employment opportunities over the mm -hmm. long haul. And through that program, committing 5% of their workforce would come from you know, community youth, which I thought was really impressive and really inspiring. And I've shared that around the company. And I think you know, seeing what good others are doing is the best form of inspiration. I love it. I love it. I love it. So you, you talked a little bit about purpose-driven company and how that's kind of important to you. Um, and, it, it, and as you can tell from your journey, as you move from company to company, you've, I think you've kept that always in mind. Are there certain values that you either demonstrate as a leader or want to demonstrate as a leader or demand in potential hires or your team in terms of mm -hmm. values? Well, definitely, you know, intellectual curiosity is the big yeah. one for me. Um, and then that willingness to you know, look at things differently, to examine things, not from just what I know, but based on, you know, multiple perspectives. To me, that's a, a, a really important part of being a marketer because you're talking to consumers and there is no one thing that is a consumer, right? Consumers are multifaceted. They're all yeah. different and have different needs and ways of um, satisfying those needs. And so really being able to understand different perspectives and look at things with different perspectives to me is, is inspirational. You hear about, you know, in, in our business, we, we look at the musician's journey and musicians' journeys are different across every instrument where they come in, their skill level, um, you know, what they play, the genre they play, 
it's all different. And so having that kind of willingness to look at, at, at different perspectives, I think is really important. And it also allows us to create more of a personal connection to the customer um, and to one another, truthfully. Um, but, but being able to understand well, what, what do you need and how can I help you get there? Um, and it's going to be different for you than it is going to be for the, the other trumpet player or the oboe player or, you know, the, the person who's rocking out on the guitar. It's all right. different. And, and for me, that's the thing that keeps me excited about the business is it's ever changing and you're always learning new things and you're always growing. And, you know, I love that it, it keeps being interesting. And so you want to find those things that kind of get you excited all the time. And I, I talk to my team a lot about, you know, what, how are we pushing the envelope? How are we being authentic? How are we doing the things that people wouldn't expect, but when we do it, they're excited about it. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned your team. I'm just curious how you kind of coach and mentor them. What's your approach when working with them? Well, I will tell you, um, we are a highly collaborative team. Um, you know, there's always a lot of people in, in our meetings and in our sessions and we deal with a problem and we look for a solution. We do it within a framework that, you know, here is sort of our strategy and our strategic brand plan. Here's kind of what our brand represents and how we position it. Then we try to keep focus on that, but really kind of push the envelope wherever we possibly can to do things that are unique and exciting. And then we know that those things that are unique and exciting can sometimes be a heck of a lot of work. So mm -hmm. we are um, willing to bring people in from other disciplines in the business, whether it's merchants or whether it's store operations and try to find ways to solve problems together. Um, I think that's a big part of what makes us successful is our willingness to kind of get in the room, roll up our sleeves and kind of figure it out and figure out in a way that makes sense, not just for marketing, but makes sense for you know, merchandising and supply chain and, and our distribution centers and our stores and all of the components of the business. Uh, you mentioned from your time at Pepsi, some, some of the products you launched were big hits and some were flops. Yeah. So I'm curious when you're pushing the envelope with your team and trying to, you know, trying to push boundaries, when do you know when the idea is a great one and it's going to flourish or it's time to cut it and learn from <laughs> our, our mistakes? You know, that's a, that's a really good skill. I think that when you're really vested in an idea, it's really hard to go. This yeah. isn't quite getting there. But one of the things that I think we try to do is make risk okay. And I think that sometimes you don't step back from what is, you know, appearing to be a failure because you don't want to have the risk. You don't want to have the, you don't have a failure. And so you try to create failure as it's a learning opportunity, right? You know, I, I, I will tell you one of the things that I remember about Pepsi that it, they did very well was when you have a failure, you celebrate it. We have failure yeah. parties. And I've tried to take that along the way. You know, the, you know, there are some ideas that, you know, go, well, that one really didn't get us anywhere. So let's celebrate, you know, the failure and let's talk about why it didn't work or what could have we done differently or what could we do better next time. Um, and you kind of just want to keep learning from them um, and not be afraid to take the risk or, or be afraid of failure. That, that's actually amazing to hear, particularly for a company as giant as PepsiCo is. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you know, Guitar Center, not quite as big as Pepsi, but certainly, you know, not, not tiny either, um, because it feels like the larger the company, the less chances they're typically willing to take. But it didn't sound like that was the culture. You know, I haven't. Um, I've been fortunate. I haven't really worked in in companies that in, in marketing anyway that weren't willing to to try or mm -hmm. willing to take risks. I mean, if you look at you know I was at the Walt Disney Company for a long period of time, and you, you think about um, you know they crank out content and movies and TV shows and all of that. The odds of having a successful you know a, a blockbuster movie pretty slim. Right. So you're right. constantly taking risk and and learning from that risk and saying, well, this didn't work or did it or what did where did we where did we go wrong? Um, and so the opportunity to kind of continue to refine is really important because yeah. you learn from the mistakes, you make some different you know assumptions, and then sometimes you say, you know, that didn't work then, but let's try it again, but let's yeah. do it this way, you know. I love that. I love that. Okay. I'm going to shift gears a little. So at Setup, we're marketing matchmakers, and that often means we connect brands and marketing agencies together. Sure. So we sort of live in the space between. We're not a marketing agency. We're not a brand, but we sort of match them together. 
So I'm curious, either at Guitar Center or even in a previous life, how have you typically worked with marketing agencies? You know, it's always a little bit different depending on the need uh, of the company and, and quite honestly, depending on the complexity. So at Guitar Center, we don't have a marketing agency or a creative agency. We are our own. We are in-house. And part of that is because the business is very, very complex, um, yeah. you know, across every component. You know, we manage financial marketing, we manage gift card marketing, we manage all of the different categories of instruments, lessons, rentals, repairs, you know, business to business, very hard to find an agency that could span, you know, across all that. And we've cultivated that, um, that in-house, but we know we're not good media buying agencies. We're not, mm -hmm. good, we're not a good media buying agency. So we hired, we have a very strong media buying agency that guides us and directs us and um, is, you know, been a fantastic partner. And so you find the, you know, what your need is based on your skill and then fill that need with external help. Yeah. You know, PR is another area that, you know, we, um, we have outside support in. We have a very small PR team inside. And so we use that external resource because they're the experts in it. And I'm not going to build that expertise in, in right. the department. In other companies, you know, I've gone through, um, you know, very formal, um, you know, agency reviews and, you know, all the presentations and all of the, you know, kind of bid process to get there. And, and I think that, that that works, but it's not always the only thing because you can end up with an agency that you've gone through this really formal process, but you don't fit with. Right, you don't right, right. feel you don't get that you know Vulcan mind meld with, and and then I've worked with agencies that you know I've seen their work, I've admired their work, thought there was a parallel between some of the things they've done, and we've sat down and talked and we've done some projects together, and then realized I really like working with this agency. They really get us. There's yep. something about that that makes a difference too. So every situation is different. It, we we talk a lot here at, at setup about capability and chemistry. And I used to think that it was when, when a brand hires a marketing agency, it was 50% capability and 50% chemistry. Now I think it's maybe 35% capability and 65% chemistry because yeah. at the end of the day, you want to work with an agency that feels like an extension of your team that meshes well with your team. Yeah. And um, there are a lot of capable agencies out there. It's just a question yeah. of which one's got the right chemistry for you and the right fit for you. Absolutely. And I would also say chemistry goes all the way to chemistry or passion about the business. Oh, you yeah. know, that you look for an agency that is really curious about your business, that's really vested in the business and, you know, wants to go out and see stores and wants to sit in on the presentation from Fender with the latest guitars. Yeah. And, and, and so that level of engagement, I think, is really, really important in, in the business. Very hard um, with agency folks that, you know, don't have a relationship with what the product is you sell or really can't relate to it. Right. Well, it, it's interesting that one of the variables that probably helps an agency get selected most, I think, is passion for the brand, passion for the business and showing the client that you really, really care about their yeah. business, particularly. Uh, I can remember in my previous life at an agency, I, I ran marketing and business development we didn't win a particular pitch. And the client, I asked the client why, and she said, it just became clear to me that you all just didn't really super, didn't really care about our business that much. Mm -hmm. And she was right. And we didn't win because of that. And it was clear. Um, so I'm, you mentioned this a little bit, uh, particularly for Guitar Center, but are there certain functions that you would never, ever, ever outsource because you feel that they're core to your business? And there are certain functions you would always want to outsource because you want that ex either excess outside capacity mm -hmm. because you don't have enough arms and legs to do all the things you want to do or excess capability because they have some knowledge or expertise that you don't have. You mentioned media planning and buying as one yeah. and public relations as one. Are there mm -hmm. certain other disciplines that you just always want to keep in-house and or always want to outsource? You know, um, one that I would, I've always outsourced, I've never built the, the capability inside an organization, and that is, you know, SEM management and, mm -hmm. and APC. 
you know, the, the level of capability and, you know, functional algorithms and keeping up with the changes in. Yeah. You know, Moving targets. Behavior. Yeah. I, I, I want, I want an expert. You know? yeah. um, so that is definitely, you know, an, an, an area that we would look to. I think that there are, there's situational things sometimes. So, you know, web design, UX, sometimes I've used an agency, sometimes it's internal. It really just depends on what, you know, kind of where you are in the journey. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something that I, I, I've outsourced creative, I've had internal creative, um, I, I've done it on a project basis. I think the flexibility in that is really important. You know, even with our business where I've said everything is, you know, managed kind of in-house, we, we use an outside production company. Um, for our TV work, because mm -hmm. they, you know, they have all of the facility and capability. And what I wanted when I came to this business was a consistent approach to the brand and how we showed up in our biggest vehicles. And, you know, we had this belief and I, I you know, I, I go back to, I have a, a amazing creative director and amazing VP creative. And I, I go back to the conversation we had and we were talking about Nobody in this business has really looked at the beauty of the instrument. It's always mm. here's Slash playing the guitar, or here's right. you know the you know the the demo of the, the the guitar. But nobody's ever looked at the beauty of the instrument. Yeah. And so we found this amazing production company that has you know all this robotic camera work. And I said, literally, I want to feel like what I'm seeing on TV in this big, beautiful you know 4K environment. I want to feel like I'm in that X-wing fighter, you know, from Star Wars, flying up the the neck of that guitar. Yeah. I want to see every nuance and the beauty of the wood and the strings, and they were able to do that. And, yeah. and so, you know, it, it, there's oftentimes situational things. You go, I'm not going to be able to do that. I I've, I've got a very big content team that produces, you know, video, but I can't. They can't do that. So well, you, you came up with the thoughts. idea. You came up with the idea, but then you're talking about them helping with the execution of that idea because yeah. it's a it's a technical capability that you just yeah. don't have in house. But they've taken it beyond that, you know, from yeah. from this initial like I want to see see that kind of moment to they've translated across you know every ad we've done for the last couple of years. They've translated across um, every instrument we've done. They've even made drumsticks look amazing, you know, by dropping them. And it, I mean, they're just very, very creative that way. And that's stuff, stuff that they're constantly pushing the envelope and coming back to us with like crazy ideas. What if we did this with water? Yeah. You know? right. <laughs> which, is, which is really right. fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I love it. All right. So as marketers, mm -hmm. sometimes we struggle to translate the work we're doing to the non-marketing functions within the organization. You know, we think like marketers, but sometimes CEOs and CFOs and other, you know, procurement people and all kinds of other people. Mm -hmm. so, so my question is, how do you demonstrate the value of marketing to the non-marketing functions of the organization that maybe don't always get marketing? I think that's a really great question because it is not always easy. Um, you know, I, here at, at Guitar Center, I, the good news is I think we have a lot of good marketing believers, which is is fun. Um, we we try to not just be the order takers, but be the partners in well, what are you trying to solve, um, and then how can we help you do that? So we position ourselves as kind of part of the solution, not a separate organization saying I, I want a poster. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, where this was, I thought would be the biggest challenge for me in demonstrating the value of marketing was in, at Stanford in healthcare. And, you know, I was dealing with probably the most amazing doctors, you know, in many instances in, on the planet and thinking, what, what is the value that they see from marketing? What do they really want yeah. out of it? And, you, you know, there, I go back to there's a, an amazing pediatric cardiologist, heart surgeon um, at Stanford, and you know, he'd be in surgery for 14 hours and then come meet with me because he believed in the value of telling wow. the story and telling about their capabilities and that he felt marketing was the vehicle to do that. I go back to it and think my bias was they're not going to appreciate it. I was completely wrong. Hmm. They they absolutely felt that we were the storytellers for what they did, and I and I've never forgotten that is, you know, letting people see that we can tell the story for them and help them, 
um, to bring new customers, to bring, to improve their reputation, you know, to, you know, help with patients, whatever it happens to be, you know, I love the fact that we tell the story of the business and, and it is that simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, to, to, to use my trumpet as an analogy, it's like, you're the bell of the trumpet, but there's a whole bunch of other tubes that make up the guts of, you know, from the vibrating lips to the wind being blown through to the finger yeah. on the valve, the output is, it, marketing gets to kind of control what the output is to some Absolutely. extent. Absolutely. And usually when um, it comes out, it's a pretty good song. Nice. Um, so it could either be a guitar center or even a previous role. Is there a particular campaign that taught you a lot because either it was a huge success or even it was a big flop and you learned more from it than you would have if it were a huge success? So I have a couple. Um, I will tell you, you know, we did a campaign last fall in the middle of COVID that I thought was wonderful. Um, I still love it. And we sort of stayed with it a little bit. And that was our Make Music campaign where we talked to artists um, and have them share why they make music, why it matters to them. And we um, brought in her and Phineas and Juanes and, um, you know, Mike Campbell from, you know, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and just all these different stories about why they make music was really heartfelt. And in the moment of COVID felt so right to be talking about why music is important yeah, to them. Yeah, why it matters. Um, so it was really, I thought, you know, our, we produced most of it in-house. I thought our team did a spectacular job with it. So that's one I'm really proud of. And then another one, it's, it goes back to my time at Stanford. And it, it was, we were looking at where women were deciding to have their babies. And, you know, an academic medical institution is not always your first choice because it's an academic medical institution. Yeah, right, right. You don't and want to do so experiment. So right, right. And we were doing a lot to really work on that, you know, that experience for the customer and be, you know, um, you know, offer all of the same, you know, benefits and accoutrements that everybody else was offering, but nobody really could see that differentiator. And the agency that we worked with at the time came up with this campaign that I, it literally, it still gives me chills. And it was really just start strong. Because of the capability of the Stanford doctors and their neonatal doctors and, and, and all of the capability and care that you, you take the, the fear out of it. And so that this, we, we had billboards all over, you know, San Francisco Bay area and we did it on television, just this little baby hand, start strong, you know, mm. and it was so compelling and it spoke volumes about the capability of the organization and people wanted to learn more about that difference. It's all of the accoutrement, but with the kind of backbone of the Stanford capability, Stanford medicine capability to make sure that you know, children are born healthy. Um, wow. It was really a very compelling campaign, one that I still, it still gives me goosebumps to think about. Yeah. Well, but I think the best campaigns do that for us, where we, you, if, if we can feel them viscerally and they make an, you know, it's not just a splashy creative, it's not just, but it actually has um, real substance behind what goes into the, the message yeah. that's, that's truly the best kind of marketing we can do. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as always be authentic. Be authentic to who you are, who the brand is. You know, tell that story because that if you feel it and people feel it, that will resonate um, as opposed to saying just what you think people want to hear to make the decision to support your brand or your business. It's really be authentic to what you provide and who you are that I think makes all the difference in brand loyalty. Yeah, totally. All right, I'm gonna shift gears into some fun questions that have nothing okay. to do with, with any of the things we talked about. Is there a particular band or book <laughs> or quote or movie that really inspires you? Oh my goodness, um, there's so many great bands. Um, you know, I, I grew up in, the 70s, 80s kind of, you know, rock and roll. I'm a big, yeah. I'm from the Bay Area. I'm a big fan of Journey. Um, you, you know, all of that um, speaks to me, you know, the, the, but at the end of the day, my very favorite quote is really so simple. It's just, it is what it is and nothing more. 
And, and there's something about that kind of simplicity that just says, take it for what it is. Don't make it a bigger deal than it has to be. And, and you'll get through it. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you hear that in, in a lot of kind of told differently in a lot of songs and movie soundtracks and so on. But, but for me, that's always been kind of the core thing is, you know, it is what it is and nothing more. Great. So other than your family, you mentioned you have a daughter. Yes. Where do you find joy outside of work? Um, well, I have to admit that we did we did get a, a pandemic puppy. Apparently, that oh. is a big thing. guitars and pandemic puppies. Yeah. We already had one, um, and so we got a second. So I have two corgis, um, both both boys, and they are hysterical. You know, if you if you're familiar with corgis, their legs are this big and their bodies are this long. Yeah, and their ears are gigantic. So they're a constant. They're the royal, they're the royal dogs, right? They, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they are. They are the queen's. The dog. royal family keeps or the queen keeps yeah. corgis. Yeah, yeah, and um, and they're hysterically funny, and you know we've always had dogs, we've always had big dogs, and so having these two guys, it's just it's a hoot, you know, and and so that's a lot of fun, and we take them. They love to go to the beach. We walk. We go to dog parks. You know, we're always. They they love to ride in the car. I have a convertible, which is really fun with corgis. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 a really good time. Um, my daughter is away is in Los Angeles, but she's at college, and she comes home just to play with the dogs. So it, they are kind of like our source it's of bait as right well. Is what you're saying? Oh, yeah. also total bait. total kid right. bait. Come on. <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah. Okay. So is there a band? I had a band. Is there a brand yeah. that you've never worked on that you always have really admired, and what makes you admire that brand? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's a couple. You know, I, at one point in my career, before I worked at Disney, I would have said Disney because that yeah. was just a brand that has always spoken to me. Other brands that I admire, um, you know, are the ones that you'll always hear people say Apple, you know, I think, you know, beautifully smart. I love their focus on design. I love their, their thoughtfulness on, on how they present um, and make it so simple. Um, that simplicity is really compelling. Um, you know, I, I love, you know, Nike for a lot of the same reasons. They really understand their customer. They really understand their product and what they're offering um, and their encouragement. And then there's some um, little brands that I, I dearly love that I think are really kind of compelling. Um, you know, uh, a, a retail brand that I think is is amazing is Anthropology. I love the storytelling that they do. I love that they really know who they are, and every decision they make is focused on who they are. I love their window fronts. I, I just think that they're they're um, really clever in how they approach things. And then um, the other thing that um, I, I love is anything that speaks to me about fun and, and um, getting out and doing things. Javiana is a great brand. I love the idea that flip-flops are not just flip-flops. Flip-flops are life and, and they are a lifestyle and there's something different. And I love kind of their approach to their business as well. Nice. Okay. Uh, is there a fictional story or realm that you would like to live in if you could? You know, um, yeah, probably just because it's humor and it's fun and it's a little silly. I mean, I could say lots of wonderful realms. Like I, I spent a lot of time during COVID watching The Last Kingdom and Vikings and all that. And I was gonna say Vikings. Um, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is I would love to live in Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. It's happy all the time, right. it's silly all the time. You know, there's funny little songs and tunes. And the biggest problem you have is where's Pluto? Right, right, yeah. right, right. This would be a pretty happy world if, if it was <laughs> a little, little more Mickey Clubhouse, a little yeah. less maybe dark uh, vampires. Yeah. Movies yeah. Or something. Um, okay, so my last question for you is, is there something that you would wish, you wish that I asked as part of this conversation that I didn't ask yet? You know, the only thing that, I, that comes to mind is, um, and we sort of talked about it, but, you know, I think Right now, there are, you know, marketing is changing and, and has been for a while, and I call it modern marketing, and we think about data and analytics and performance and optimization and all those things. And, and the question that I would, um, you could have asked me is, how do you stay true to your brand in the midst of the data? Mm. And, and I think that that's something that I ponder every day. You know, are we optimizing just for results 
or are we optimizing in the short term or are we optimizing for loyalty and brand engagement and you know referral and how do you measure those you know how do you measure those when you're looking at you know what your ROAS is and and all of the metric side how do you balance art and science because marketing yeah. is not just science and it's not just art it is the combination of those two things I love that um I I uh I'm a person who's moved by good creative when, you know, when somebody comes up with truly good creative, even better if the creative is inspired by data and has, has underpinnings that are based on a, an insight that's, sure. that's, but at the end of the day, it's that balance between left brain, right brain, data and creative, you know, the science and the art together mm -hmm. that makes, I think, the most beautiful marketing. I agree. Totally agree. Great. All right. So Janine Daddario, this was the most amazing conversation. Janine is the chief marketing officer of Guitar Center, which, as you heard, is not just the retail stores, but a multi-channel uh, retailer of musical equipment, lessons, B2B, the whole works. But thank you so much, Janine. This has been an amazing conversation. Thank you, Joe. I really enjoyed it.